So Jennifer, uh, we're talking about our mutual patient, Andy Lucy. Um, I don't know if you remember when he originally presented a couple of years ago. My recollection is that he might have had some unrelated symptoms, perhaps uh, related to his gallbladder disease that led to uh, ultrasound and then CAT scan. And then they actually discovered a large mass on the left side, in the left kidney. Is that kind of the typical presentation these days that you incidentally find the uh, kidney mass? Like that? I mean, especially in his case where he didn't really have any other symptoms of the kidney cancer, about 70% of the kidney tumors I see are incidentally found, meaning that, you know, the patient came in for back pain or went to the ER and then they find the kidney mass. I mean, I think it's rare that I'll see patients these days that either have blood in the urine or severe pain or some other symptom that's related to the kidney tumor itself. But Andy was really young. I mean, he presented to us with a large tumor. He presented with some lung nodules that at the time we weren't exactly sure what to make, but we knew that they existed and we were a little suspicious for, you know, metastatic kidney cancer. But I mean, from your perspective, did you think that there was a chance that they would maybe fade away if I took the kidney tumor out? Uh, that may happen occasionally, but rarely. And I think we really were not sure. These were too small to uh, to be definitive. Uh, and his kidney mass was, was quite large. And ultimately, I know that we made the mutual decision to uh, remove it. And in fact, it was, it was kidney cancer. These lung nodules were kind of always in the background of uncertain significance, but then within a few months, if I recall, maybe five or six months on one of the subsequent scans, we saw that they were growing um, and um, that was uh, unfortunately the, uh, uh, the sign that his cancer recurred. Did you so decide to put him on the vaccine trial Right. when you saw the masses growing or was that even before that happened? Um, that was when we, dis when we saw that the lung nodules started growing. We actually had one of them biopsied for confirmation. And you're right, at that time we uh, had very interesting clinical trial uh, open here at St. John's that utilized kind of the backbone of immunotherapy, standard immunotherapy drugs of nivolumab and ipilimumab. But then on top of that, uh, uh, in the context of the study, we generated vaccine based on a specific uh, detailed personalized assessment of his tumor uh, and that vaccine was kind of added into the mix of the immunotherapy. It was given, uh, these vaccine uh, treatments were given as an injection under the skin. Now what happened was that he uh, started with combination of nivolumab, ipilimumab and after just one dose he developed very significant side effects. And this sometimes unfortunately happens. These are very powerful treatments that activate immune system against cancer. But unfortunately, occasionally they kind of overstimulate the immune system. And in his particular case at that time, he developed severe inflammation of the pancreas that required you know, hospitalization, steroids, and eventually led to him uh, developing diabetes from that. So he, he had pretty significant complications from from the immunotherapy. So how many cycles of immunotherapy did he get? That took only one cycle, one dose of each drug. And after that, he had all these uh, side effects. But uh, you know, at the same time, as bad as that was, he started responding to the immunotherapy quite well. Even though he uh, had only even one, one dose. Sometimes yeah. it's quite amazing how powerful even one dose of uh, immune drugs can be. And uh, you know, he's started having complete regression of his pulmonary uh, nodules. Although eventually, because he required very long break from immunotherapy until the resolution of these side effects, there were some setbacks and he developed um, some additional new spots. Um, and they only started regressing again when we were able to restart him on a different regimen that was a little bit milder, but still having a core of immunotherapy, but also uh, addition of one of these targeted agents, uh, anti-angiogenic agents. So, so he's been um, treated with that treatment um, for, for quite a long time and 
had this remarkable, steady, gradual regression of all the visible metastases. So what do you mean by anti-androgenic agent? And the angiogenic, angiogenic, okay, yeah. Sorry. So essentially, yeah. So the, specifically, what he was getting in the second after he had the initial side effects from nivolumab, ipilimumab, when he recovered, we switched him to pembrolizumab or Keytruda and uh, Inlita or Exitinib. So Inlita is the is an oral medication that uh, kind of blocks the formation of blood vessels by tumors. So we refer to anti-angiogenic, angiogenesis, anti-angiogenic. By the way, I mean, it wasn't the end of his troubles with, uh, with uh, side effects of immunotherapy. He had, in addition to this initial episode of pancreas inflammation, diabetes, he then had also inflammation of the liver uh, and then inflammation of the thyroid gland that led to very significant overactivity of the thyroid gland. So he had a couple of hospitalizations um, along the line for management of complications of immunotherapy, but we are very hopeful, of course, that it was all worth it because you know he has recovered uh, from most of it. I mean, he unfortunately requires insulin for management of diabetes, but you know, the liver, uh, thyroid and gland inflammation have all resolved and uh, as, as you know, uh, several months ago, we decided after approximately two years of these immunotherapy treatments that uh, when there was no evidence of persistent cancer, that we just stop everything and, and he's considered in remission. So Completely. So he's not on yeah. anything anymore. He's not on anything anymore. Wow. And that seems to be the current understanding of how to manage you know, patients with immunotherapy drugs that uh, in, in many cases, majority of cases, when you achieve this very dramatic regression of the cancer to the point that it's hard to even see it, it's not no, no longer visible, that we, we don't continue immunotherapy indefinitely, we just stop it because it seems to be extremely durable effect and in many patients we, we think that it, it's, it, it's cure. I mean, we're still early here to use that word perhaps, but certainly that's the hope. If Andy recurred, would you go, what drugs would you go to next? Well, that's, we're obviously hoping that that's not going to happen, but in those cases where when the cancer comes back, a lot of it could depend on the interval between the completion of therapy and the recurrence. Right. So I would say if it's a late, late recurrence, so let's say five years, five years or even less, even more than a year, you could have a lot of different strategies. So, if, for example, if it's an isolated area that uh, that is a site of recurrence uh, accessible for the excellent surgeon like you, for example, to remove, I think that would be very reasonable approach to go after the surgically and perhaps even watch it and and some of these patients are cured just with surgical intervention so so you're there's still major role for surgery we're not quite ready to say that you know immunotherapy can cure everybody everywhere so that would be one scenario the other would be perhaps re-challenging with the same immunotherapy drugs because they worked before and they may actually work again now, the more, I think, troublesome would be circumstance if the uh, relapse is shorter uh, or closer to in time, then I think we would maybe tend to try to use some different regimen, perhaps, you know, clinical trial with novel uh, immunotherapy drugs, but um, it really depends on the specific circumstances. Yeah, no, but I think his case is definitely incredible because because he was so young and right. because he recurred or may have been metastatic at the time when he came to us in general, which is likely what we suspect. Right, right. So that was the most significant, I think, thing about right. his case. I still think that the surgical, inter I mean, the timing of removal of the kidney mass, it has become somewhat controversial. As you know, in the past, that was always like the first step. We did, yeah. Nowadays, we kind of tend to start more with drug therapy, but I really don't think that this primary tumor would have 
regressed completely. I think it was too big. So I think it would have probably come out anyway. Uh, and I think that helped to you know, remove the majority of the cancer tumor, cancer mass. You know, I've had a lot of patients that are, you know, you have had metastatic cancer and from all various types, patients with melanoma, pancreas, kidney, mm -hmm. and there's some suspicion that unless you have some severe reactions like pneumonitis or inflammation of the lungs or mm -hmm. thyroid yeah. or diabetes, that that's when you know it's really, really work, working yeah. and those are the patients sometimes that you actually do see the best results in. So I don't know if that's a shared sentiment by the medical oncology community, but I know I've heard patients talking about that. I think that makes sense and there's clearly, though, there's a really fine line in activating the immune system adequately so it can fight cancer, but at the same time it, it, can, it can be very dangerous in some patients when it's overactive. But I think you're right. I think the sweet spot is probably somebody who has relatively mild or moderate reactions that you can see. Like one of the classical example would be the skin reaction called vitiligo, where you have uh, depigmentation yes. uh, of the melanin that's essentially attacked by the immune system. And that, that's kind of the visual uh, sign, if you will, that, hey, the immune system is really engaged here, it's active, but it's kind of more or less a cosmetic issue, not nothing dangerous. But these side effects you know, are sometimes quite daunting. And unfortunately, Andy was on the receiving end of, uh, of a lot of those side effects that were very serious. But fortunately, you know, he, he recovered well from most of them. And um, and you know, hopefully, if he remains in a mission and cure, I think he would wholeheartedly agree that it was all worth it. Um, but but I agree with you that that these side effects can be an indication of uh, activity, adequate activity of the drugs. Oh, no yes. question. And yeah. the stability of the immune reaction. That if they're right. still having some of those quote unquote complications or issues. It's still, it's still active, ongoing. Yeah, it's Absolutely. still ongoing within their system. So it's such right, a different right. mentality than I think when we were doing chemotherapy. Right. Although we didn't really do chemotherapy for kidney yes. cancers, it was more anti anti angiogenic. Yeah, drugs. exactly. Yeah. Those are the previous kind of the main. It's still very active. It's still very valuable and used. But but immunotherapy really became kind of the core of treatment for uh, for kidney cancer. And what uh, what's really different about immunotherapy uh, as compared to uh, targeted or antigen, anti-angiogenic therapy or chemotherapy that, as you know, it tends to be, if it works, it tend to, tends to work really long term. Right. With chemotherapy or anti-angiogenic therapy, it's unfortunately, it, they are still in many cases very useful uh, in various cancers, but typically for metastatic disease, when you stop the treatment, the, the cancer tends to rebound. Uh, it's not a durable, permanent effect, typically. So immunotherapy is definitely unique for that durability, that persistent effect that continues even when you stop the drugs. But I think you're right. The culture around when to do surgery has changed. I think now we do tend to try the more systemic immunotherapy first for patients that we suspect already have cancer outside the right. kidney. And it's still interesting to me that even though when we do that, we've had many patients, the kidney tumor, tumor even though it may not be biologically active, like alive, uh -huh. it still persists. And it still ends up needing to come out in many right. cases because you're not exactly sure what's still there. Exactly. So. Yeah, and I think as I pointed out, this whole concept of selective surgery for maybe like isolated recurrences or residual cancer, I think is very valuable in many patients that I've seen where, where you have um, perhaps you know, dramatic shrinkage of the tumor and, and metastasis in most areas, but you have like one troublesome resistant spot. And that I think is a perfect uh, application of surgery in those kind of settings to just remove that remaining area of concern or the area that's resistant or even the one that may relapse later. Uh, to, to just go after that surgery. It's, well, and also have the tissue too, because the tissue helps guide what you're exactly, making next. Yeah. So Absolutely, that's really important yeah. for patients.